What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the show. As always, thank you for tuning in. And I'm sitting here doing show prep, and I'm trying to figure out what I need to talk about. You know, it's really difficult for me doing show prep because from the day we started the show, I always wanted this podcast to be about to be about things and information that other people aren't really talking about. And so everybody's talking about the Epstein case, which to me, I mean, I think we can all agree at this point that Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> all right. All right. Jeffrey Epstein most likely was murdered. And for whatever reason, we may never know. It's obvious it's the list, the client list that I don't think we're ever going to see because there is um, very, very powerful, rich people on that list. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that the rich elite billionaires are pretty sick people. When you, when you give the human that type of power and wealth and control, the... I don't see I don't see people as being inherently good. I think when you give somebody that much power, control and wealth and and money and and status, I think they're going to use it most likely for bad stuff eventually. You know, they may not start out that way, but I think eventually they they end up getting pretty bad. And so I I, I can just imagine what that client list look like, looks like and who's on it. But if I were to take a wild guess just off of my gut feeling here, I would imagine it's probably the most richest, powerful people in the world doing some of the most evil, disgusting, barbaric stuff in the world. I'm talking raping little boys and girls. I'm talking, who knows, maybe even human sacrifice. I'm talking like straight up ancient Roman gladiator, just straight up evil, dark stuff, man. <laughs> I mean, it's hard, it's hard telling what these rich elite billionaires are capable of because they can essentially do anything they want. So as far as seeing that list, I don't think we're ever going to get it. So case, I, I, so I just didn't even really want to bother talking about it. Everybody else seems to be talking about it. And that's one of the problems with, that's one of the challenges with this podcast is trying to find things and inform you, my listeners, with stuff that everybody's not talking about, but to inform you with stuff you need to know. And the Jeffrey Epstein stuff, I think we all, like I said, have a pretty good idea what happened. Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. And most likely it's because he knew things that would probably land people in jail, very rich, powerful people. And so they most likely had him killed. Um, so I didn't really want to talk about that. Everybody's talking about it. I didn't really want to talk about the, the southern border because Republicans and conservatives, and even on the show, we've been talking about this for months. We've been talking about the southern border crisis for months, and nothing's happened. You have Republicans have had power for over a year now. They haven't done anything. Why? I think we can assume it's because you have rhinos within the Republican establishment that don't want to fix it because they're benefiting from it. And so it only leaves one conclusion. When you start narrowing down the, the reasons why and the qui bono, who benefits, it, it, it only leaves you with one reason. The southern border is open. We have free migration right now because it's purposeful. It's on purpose. The Biden administration and the powers that be want millions and millions of people into this country. It's not an accident. And so Unfortunately, we, re we elected the Republican Party to try and combat this, this um, onslaught, this invasion of illegal asylum seekers into this country. But they can't. They can't because they have rhinos within the establishment and they have such a slim majority, there's nothing they can do. And so to me personally, with as far as the southern border goes, there's nothing the Republicans are going to be able to do because they're cowards. They have the power to do it. They don't have the will. There is a fine line between the will to do something and the capacity to do something. At this point, the Republicans have the capacity, but they lack the will. Period. And I used this analogy when it came to Iran and funding Iran and why it's a bad idea to fund Iran, and why the, the Iran nuclear deal is a bad idea, and it leads to exactly what happened on October 7th. It is a will versus capacity issue. The Iranians may have the will to conduct acts of terrorism and barbaric savagery on innocent people, 
But as long as they do not have the capacity, i.e. the funds, the money, then they're not going to be able to do it because you need both in order to carry out something like what happened on October 7th. And so all the Biden administration did was give the Iranians to give these terrorists the capacity to pull off these attacks, to pull to pull off these this savagery. And what Donald Trump's policies did was pulled away the, the capacity. He did not give them the capacity to commit these acts of terrorism. And so the same kind of analogy for the Republican Party in the southern border, but kind of opposite. The Republican Party has the capacity to stop the barbarism that's happening at the southern border. They have the capacity to stop the rapes. They have the capacity to stop the killing. They have the capacity to stop all the savagery and the inhumanity down at the southern border. But they lack the will. (laughs) Unfortunately, that's how it is. They lack the will for the simple fact that we have rhino Republican establishment creatures swamp creatures within the Republican Party that do not want to stop what's happening at the southern border. And so therefore, it won't stop. All right. So I hope I simplified that pretty much. And I think I don't think the Republicans should sacrifice or make any big trade-offs with fixing the southern border. What, what are Republicans really going to do? Fix the southern border crisis the last six months of the Biden administration? What they should do, and, and listen, if they can, do it. But I would not I would not be trading too much for this to get this done. But first of all, it's never going to happen by the by the end of the Biden administration. Nothing substantial is going to get done at the southern border within the next 11 months. It's just not going to happen. You know, Republicans should have came in here and stopped this from day one. But because of Kevin McCarthy and the swamp creatures within the Republican Party, they passed that insane, disastrous spending bill. And that's what got Kevin Kevin McCarthy fired. But that's when it should have stopped. Like I said, the Republicans lack the will to get anything done at the southern border. The only way you're going to fix the southern border is by electing Donald Trump. That is it. Donald Trump is going to, once he gets elected and he takes the hand off the Bible, the problem at the southern border is fixed within 24 hours. Done. Boom. They'll sign a couple executive orders. They'll insert some policies. Done. Because trust me, the southern border, the officers at the southern border, all the agencies at the southern border want nothing more but to protect the southern border and protect this country, right? All they need is the policy. So, and within 24 hours, Donald Trump's going to fix the policy part of it. The next step is probably, yes, it's going to be, it's going to be dirty. It's not going to look pretty, but the Trump administration needs to start the biggest deportation campaign in U.S. history. And he's already said that's exactly what's going to happen. These people cannot stay here. You're talking about people that have been released into the country by the millions, the millions of people released into this country that we have no idea who they are. These people have a court date that's set in the 2030s, the 2030s. So you're talking about these people being here for over a decade before they even have to appear in front of a judge. And most likely they won't even do that. So this is the problem that we have. The Biden administration is doing this on purpose, right? The Republican Party has the capacity to stop it because they have the power of the purse, but they're not going to stop it because they lack the will. This is the problem with the Republican Party, and this is why they better do something in this next 11 months or they are going to lose a lot of votes. I'm telling you right now, if the Republican Party does not fix the problem within their within the party as far as the rhinos and their will to get things done for the American people, the American people will not vote for them. Why? Why would any independent or anybody a low information voter look at the Republican Party and say, yeah, I want to vote for them? Why? What do they even stand for? What does the Republican Party even stand for? Why would an independent vote for the Republican Party? At least with the Democrats, they have an objective. They're on a mission. They actually get things done. Come hell or high water, they get it done. No matter how bad it is, I mean, and it's awful. If we couldn't tell by the last by the last three years just how bad their policies are and just how destructive their policies are, but they at least get things done. They stand for something. The Republicans don't stand for anything. And if they do, they're not messaging it very well. And I'm telling you right now, if they do not get this together 
and get a cohesive movement going on within the GOP, within the Republican Party, it's over. Nobody's going to vote to give power to the Republicans. Because why would they? What have the Republicans done within a year? What? Just they can say they're not as bad as the Democrats. They passed all the Democrats spending up until now. They've allowed all the Democrats policies to, to continue as far as the southern border, uh, the, the Green New Deal bullshit. You have the renewable energy bullshit, the, the Biden administration just destroying our energy infrastructure, the weaponization of the justice system against Americans. The weaponization of the intel communities with things like the FISA courts and the FISA warrants. They funded a brand new building for the FBI. The censorship from the United States government. Like, what have the Republicans done? Nothing. And so if they don't get some type of cohesive movement together within the Republican Party, it's over for them. The Republican Party will go the way of the Whigs. And if Donald Trump doesn't get elected, it's really over for the Republican Party. Nobody will vote. In this country, again, the only people that will be voting in elections will be Democrats and Democrats will win every single election from here on out because then they would have officially destroyed the Republican Party, which is their strategy. It is their goal. Their goal is to to control our electoral process, to destroy their opposition and to persecute any political dissenters through censorship, through jailing, weaponized justice system, the judiciary, whatever it takes. And then next is going to be the Supreme Court. They will figure out a way to stack the Supreme Court to get more uh, leftist uh, ideologues inside the Supreme Court. And then they would have officially have control and taken over our entire country and our government. That's what that is the goal. These people have been playing this game for a long time. And right now we're on the end game. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose in the 2024 election. And all is going to be left on the table. The Democrats are playing for keeps. They are not messing around. And this is not just the work. I I can't I can't stress this enough. This is not a Joe Biden problem. This is a Democrat Party problem. Right. And it's not even a party, a Democratic Party problem. This is the machine versus the people. That's what this is. This, what we're watching right here, what we're watching take place is not, if you think it's Republicans versus Democrats, you're so far off from what's actually happening. And I get it. You know, a lot of people don't know what is going on. And that's the purpose of the show. But I'm here to tell you, this has nothing to do with Republicans versus Democrats. It is one, it's one gigantic system that is that is designed to look as if it's a two-party system, but it's not. It's a one-party system, the uniparty, the establishment, the swamp, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, versus the people. That's what this election's all about. And if Democrats win and they're able to lock up Donald Trump and, and, and get through this election by mass mail-in ballots or however they're going to do it, I have no idea. My guess would be the Cloward and Piven tactic because That is the tactic they've been using for the last eight years, which is create mass chaos, create instability. And then in that chaos, you essentially control the situation. Those who create the chaos control the chaos. It's the cloud and pivot tactic, essentially bringing all the institutions down to its knees. And so that you can replace it with a new system that is to overwhelm this system essentially is what it is. And that is why they're trying to destabilize this country through the migration, the, through the Southern border. They're trying to destabilize this entire country. All this is being done by the globalist elites, the George Soros, the Bill Gates, the, the Klaus Schwab's, the Larry Fink's of the world, the globalist elites. This is not a Democrat Republican issue. However, I will say that the globalists, you know, are mainly on the left. They're all leftist ideologues. Yes, you do have some global elitists on the right, like the Koch brothers, uh, and, and I could think of a few more. But for the most part, it's all leftist ideologues. But even the Koch brothers, the Republicans, they still want open borders because it's free. It's, it's cheap labor. You know what I mean? There is no incentive right now for our government, our politicians to fix what's happening at the southern border. There's only benefit for them. 
And the famous, the famous question, qui bono, who benefits? So in every situation moving forward, you just have to ask yourself that question, who benefits? Uh, we talk about this a lot on the show. Who benefited the most from January 6th? Well, the Democrats did. Certainly Nancy Pelosi did because they were able to push through the certification of that election. And if not for the riot, which I am a firm believer was a false flag operation conducted by the United States intel agencies against the American people, because of the, the, the false flag operation that they conducted, they were able to ram the certification through with no challenges, virtually no challenges, because there wasn't any challenges, was there? As soon as that riot happened, Nancy Pelosi did a recall, called everyone back in immediately. And what did they do? They voted to certify the election. And so Nancy is the only one that benefited from January 6th. And lo and behold, she is the one that created the January 6th Select Committee, the partisan one-sided committee that was unconstitutional, by the way, which multiple legal scholars have said that the J6 Committee was completely unconstitutional. Because you didn't have, it, it wasn't bipartisan. You had no ability to cross-examine witnesses. It was essentially a show trial, like they do in the Soviet Union. They created this, this appearance of a trial, even though it wasn't even a real criminal trial. They, they, they created this show trial to sway the minds of the public, essentially like propaganda. Again, the same exact stuff they did in the Soviet Union and what the Nazi Party did back in the 1930s. It was a gigantic Stalinist show trial where they brought on witnesses and they cherry picked evidence and cherry picked video footage and nobody was allowed to cross examine witnesses. Nobody. There was no cross examination. So when people like Cassidy Hutchinson get on the stand under oath and say that Donald Trump choked out a Secret Service agent to try and commandeer the beast or the presidential limo. To, to what? To take it back to the Capitol to protest with his, with his voters? Like, this is what she said under oath, sworn testimony, as a witness. And this is what you got. They use that to brainwash and manipulate the public opinion. And this does a couple things. So not only does it spread propaganda and it sets the narrative to the public, but it also poisons future jury polls mainly in Washington, D.C., exactly where these cases are happening. And so what they want is to control the narrative. They're trying to force the narrative into our society, into our culture. Think about it. What is the one thing that they're calling January 6th? An insurrection. Even though by its very definition, that was not an insurrection. But for some reason, it's an insurrection. How did they do that? Because they used the media right? Because the media and the administrative state are one and the same entity. They used the, the media apparatus to push out and repeat the words insurrection, deadly insurrection, the J6 insurrection. And they just say it over and over and over and over again on loop. And then eventually people buy it. I think the best way for you to kind of really get a gist of what is happening is to read the book George Orwell's 1984. I swear up and down, and I am more convinced now than ever, that the Democrats and the, the, the evil at large in this country, the globalist elitists, are using George Orwell's 1984 novel as like a playbook. I mean, it is so eerily similar to what we're, of, of what we're watching take place across this country right now. It is insane. It is shocking. It is shocking. When you read that book, you're going to think, my God, was he talking about what we're experiencing today? And the more time goes on, the more comparisons I can make to George Orwell's 1984 book. So that should be the homework for you guys. If you want to know what's going to happen, this is how I can, pro this is how I can kind of predict what's in the works here from the globalists, from the elitists and the Democrat Party. I can predict these things because of that book. It is almost a roadmap to a dystopian nightmare, to a authoritarianism like we've never seen before in this country. And it's unfolding right before our eyes. So that, that is the homework that I give to my listeners. Read George Orwell's 1984, and you'll understand everything that's going on right now. There's a few books I can actually recommend. 
I would recommend Mark Levin's The Democratic Party Hates America. I just finished that book yesterday. Excellent, excellent book. If you want to know what is happening and how the Democrats operate, and not only that, but essentially why the Democratic Party hates America, going all the way back to its past when it was the, con- the a party of the Confederacy through the KKK, the filibustering of the Civil Rights Movement, read Mark Levin's The Democrat Party Hates America. It is an excellent book. Another book I suggest. Well, actually, it's another. I suggest another book by Mark Levin, which is Liberty and Tyranny. Um, all of Mark Levin's books are amazing. I've read uh, most of them. I've read most of them. All of them very good. He knows exactly what the Democratic Party is doing right now. He knows exactly the, the evils at large. He knows exactly what the plan is and what the direction this country is going in. Uh, so I suggest all of Mark Levin's books. When it comes to the economy and why excessive government is bad, I would read Thomas Sowell's. Um, uh, I think it's called The um, Basic Economics or something like that. I forget which book it is. Thomas Sowell is another excellent writer. He is the, uh, the Milton Friedman, another good author. So anyways, I think it's the best, the best way to, to kind of to get on board here with where the direction this country is going in is by reading these books, reading what these people are going to do so that we can anticipate and, and, and make countermeasures to their actions. We have to. And the only way that we can create good, effective countermeasures is if we understand the situation that we're in. Situational understanding. Um, And the only way you're going to understand the situation is by reading these few books that I suggested. 1984, anything Thomas Sowell, the base uh, economics, uh, I forget what it's called, basic economics or something like that. Uh, Milton Friedman, Mark Levin, you read any of those books and you'll have a pretty good idea of where we're going and what the game plan is so that we can come up with effective countermeasures. Um, So... The as far as the court cases go with with Donald Trump, the lawlessness that we're experiencing from the cases in Jack Smith, the cases in D.C. and really throughout all the entire country with all of these frivolous cases, these 91 indictments of Donald Trump, it is unlike anything we've ever seen before. The weaponization of our justice system and our rule of law is unbelievable. We have never, ever experienced anything like this in this country and it's 250 years of existence. We are in uncharted territories, because, and the Democrat Party and the globalists have brought us here. This is not something Donald Trump did, so go figure. The exact person that they said was going to create chaos and create instability and create war and famine and death and destruction, the exact opposite is taking place. It's these people creating chaos. It's these people destroying democracy. It's these people creating destruction and death around the globe. Is that not wild? The sheer uh, projection from these people knows no bounds. It it really doesn't. And so the lawlessness that is taking place from Jack Smith and I don't know how many prosecutors he has. Essentially, he has like an entire law firm that's working on this case. And they give Donald Trump's defense six months. So these people have an entire law firm of prosecutors that have unlimited resources essentially anything that they need from the justice system because they have a judge on their side that's willing to grant anything that they want. The lawlessness that we are experiencing from the Jack Smith, uh, these 91 indictments across the country in all blue states is unbelievable. It is uncanny. And frankly, to me, it's quite terrifying. And I'm glad that the Supreme Court is starting to step in. They should have stepped in sooner, but I do think later is better than never, I suppose. Um, that's how I feel about it. Um, but Donald Trump, I got an article here from the Gateway Pundit. Donald Trump is fighting back. He's going on the offense in, in uh, Jack Smith's D.C. case. So here's an article from Christina Layla. This just came out at 12 o'clock today. It says, President Trump takes the gloves off, asks the court to hold Jack Smith in contempt for violating order. Yeah. So he's actually going on the offense, which is good. And I'm not saying Trump personally, it's his defense. But to me, the reason why I want to talk about this now is because I think these these stories are the most important stories we need to know today. The Epstein stuff, yes, it's interesting. Yes, you know, it's it's good to know 
but I just don't think it's quite there. Like it's it's good to know these things. It's good to know about Epstein, but I think we already kind of know what's happening. Epstein didn't kill himself, and it's most likely because he knows he has a lot of dirt on a lot of rich, powerful people. I think we can we can all pretty much come to that conclusion. And Tucker Carlson actually has a story coming out, I think sometime this week, where he interviews uh, Epstein's brother. And listen, the story gets even more wild. Um, maybe we'll hit on it later on in the show towards the end. But as of right now, I just didn't see that being a real huge topic to talk about. And neither the southern border either. Everybody's talking about the southern border. We all know it's a crisis. We all know why it's a crisis. And we all know that the Democrats, the Biden administration, is not going to fix the crisis. And I don't suggest Republicans give up too much because no matter what they do, the Biden administration is not going to fix the crisis because they want it. This is benefiting them. Again, qui bono, who benefits? The Biden administration, Democrats, they are changing the electoral demographics. They're trying to, it's the great replacement theory, folks. <laughs> the, the same thing that they tell you that it's a conspiracy theory, don't believe it, it's not happening, you're crazy if you say that. It's actually what they're doing. And they admit that, that that's exactly what they're doing. So I, and everybody's talking about it. We know what's happening there. It's awful. There's millions, millions and millions of immigrants flooding this country. But I already said how we can fix it. The only way to fix it is by electing Donald Trump so that he can come in and implement the right policies. Start the, the biggest deportation campaign in U.S. history. It's going to be tough. It's not going to look pretty, but we're going to have to do it. It's got to be done. It's unsustainable what the Biden administration and the globalist elites and the Democrats have done to this country. And if Donald Trump does not get elected and these things don't get fixed immediately, this country is going to collapse. And you have to ask yourself, well, who benefits if the country collapses? Well, the globalists benefit because now they get to implement whatever system they want. Oh, capitalist capitalism didn't work. You know, the Constitution didn't work. We need to rewrite it. They want to refound the United States of America. So in order for them to do that, they have to collapse the United States. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. So, again, the only way you're going to fix it is by electing Donald Trump and getting somebody in there that is going to reverse all of this stuff. And Donald Trump, to me, is the only person that can do it. Um, he's not beholden to he's not beholden to any big donors, special interests, lobbyists. It's just him. Him and us. Donald Trump represents the people. He inspires millions around the globe. He is the true leader of our day. He will go down as the most influential person in politics in U.S. history. And hands down, they're going to be talking about him for generations. And so the only way you're going to fix the problems that we're going through right now is through Donald Trump. So I didn't want to talk about the southern border. I wanted to talk about the lawfare, the lawlessness happening. To happening in this country to me needs to be top priority because if they can do it to Donald Trump, they can do it to me, they can do it to you, they can do it to anybody. And so this is why I think this is the most important topic to talk about. And Donald Trump up until now hasn't really went on the offensive as far as, you know, filing lawsuits against Jack Smith up until now. And so President Trump's attorneys on Thursday asked the court to hold special counsel Jack Smith in contempt for violating Judge Chutkin's order, staying all proceedings in the January 6th case against Trump. Um, so here is a quote. President Donald Trump respectfully moves this court for an order to show cause why prosecutors Jack Smith, Molly Gaston and Thomas Wyndham, collectively the prosecutors as a whole, should not be held in contempt for violating the court's order staying any further proceedings that would move this case towards trial or impose additional burdens of litigation on the, defend on the defendant. And it has docket number 186 at 2, the state order Trump's lawyer wrote in an order reviewed by the Gateway Pundit. Okay. So it goes on. So essentially, you guys remember when Judge Chutkin, because the Supreme Court accepted Donald Trump's immunity case, Judge Chutkin put a stay in, which means no proceedings could go forward the, it just puts a freeze on the entire case. Everything has to stop. There can be no motions going forward. Nothing could be done until, until the process was complete. So in other words, Jack Smith tried to jump over the appeals court and go right to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court denied it. We talked about this on one of my shows a couple weeks ago. 
the Supreme Court denied it, which was essentially a, a uppercut to Jack Smith's case. And so the Supreme Court said, no, you're not going to jump the process. Donald Trump, you keep saying that Donald Trump is this you know, normal person now. He's just a citizen and he should and nobody's above the law and he should have to face the law just like everyone else. Well, you can't say that on one hand and then on the other hand, try and completely leapfrog the appellate court and take something right to the Supreme Court. It doesn't work that way. So they want their cake and eat it too. On one hand, they want him to be a normal citizen that's not above the law, while on the other hand, you know, leapfrogging the appellate courts and taking stuff right to the Supreme Court. Well, it failed. So Jack Smith now has to go through the proper channels, which means to the appeals court. So, and all this is about the immunity case. And you know what? I think Lisa, I think um, Christina Layla talks about this right here. So let's get back to the article. Last month, Obama appointed Judge Tanya Chutkin paused Trump's January 6th case in D.C. amid a dispute over the former president's immunity argument. In September, Trump was hit with four counts in Jack Smith's January 6th case up in D.C. Conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction and attempt to obstruct an official proceeding, and conspiracy against rights. Trump's lawyers argued that Trump is immune from federal prosecution for alleged crimes committed while he served as U.S. president. Yes, so this is the immunity case. This is essentially saying, like, and it's awful. Like, this is probably one of the most, I don't know, this is probably one of the most important cases that we've seen in the Supreme Court for I don't know how long. I mean, this will, this case right here will dictate the future of this country. Because essentially what it's saying is, can presidents be held criminally liable for things they did as president? You could see what type of change it will happen because of a case like this. So if the Supreme Court says yes, that presidents can be held liable, then that means every single president after leaving office will be held criminally liable for anything. So exactly what they're doing to Trump, they can do to any president. And that goes for both sides. So Joe Biden leaves office. Republicans can criminally indict and persecute Joe Biden for the crimes he committed while he was president. So you can see just how big of a case this is and what type of impact it's going to make on future presidents. I mean, it'll essentially nullify the executive branch because presidents will be too scared to do anything because of political targeting after he leaves office. And because of, from what I've gathered, I think the statute of limitations in... um Federal crimes is five years, I think. So if a president is serving a term, he does something in his first year in office, that means for one year after he leaves the, the office, the opposing party can go after him, charging him criminally with stuff that he did as president. So I think you know and I know that the Supreme Court is never going to allow this to happen because it'll essentially turn our country, our government, into a banana republic overnight. And so the Supreme Court said, no, we're not making a ruling on that right now. You're going to take that through the correct process. Well, while this process was supposed to take place, Judge Chutkin put a stay in, which a stay essentially means everything freezes, no motions can be filed, nothing can be done. This court, this case is frozen in place until the appeals court makes a decision. Whatever decision it makes, if it's the wrong decision and Donald Trump's defense doesn't agree, then they will appeal it then to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has to have oral arguments and weeks and months goes into it and then they'll make a ruling. But either way, based off of what um, Donald Trump's defense lawyer said on Charlie Kirk's show, he doesn't see this case happening before election time. And so because Judge Chuck can put a stay and the Supreme Court said, no, you're going to go through the proper channels. This case essentially is never going to see the light of day before the election, period. That's that's I mean, that's essentially what that means. The, the likelihood of this actually being heard before the election is very, very unlikely. And that's essentially what Donald Trump's lawyer said in a interview with Charlie Kirk the other day. Well, Jack Smith simply denied Judge Chutkin's stay, and he just started filing motions. And so back to Christina Layla here. Jack Smith skipped over the appellate court and went straight to the U.S. Supreme Court on Trump's immunity claims. We talked about that. So Jack Smith will now have to wait for the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for D.C. to make a decision. Oral arguments begin on January 9th. 
And so oral arguments have to be heard in the af- in the appellate court, in the appeals court, and then they have to make a decision. This could take weeks. It could take months. And just like Trump's lawyer said, then it'll go to the Supreme Court where they have to do oral arguments, which could take weeks and even months, even years, really, since it's such a big, complex issue and such an important issue. There needs to be a plethora of arguments being made here. And, and uh, personally, it's not something you want to rush through because with bad cases, you get bad law. Um, and so they're going to take their time with this one. And so this is why Jack Smith is trying to push these motions through, even though there was a stay put in place. And Donald Trump's defense was like, yo, dude, you were told not to do anything. This case is frozen. But yet he keeps filing motions, which is violating the judge's order. And that's essentially what he's doing here. So in the meantime, however, Jack Smith isn't allowed to file any motions in the D.C. case due to Judge Chutkin's order halting all proceedings pending a decision from the appellate court. All pretrial proceedings are on hold. However, this has not stopped Jack Smith from filing motions. Last week, Jack Smith filed a motion in court to prevent President Trump from blaming provocateurs and undercover agents from the January 6th Capitol riot. (laughs) Can you believe this? The freaking kahunas on these people. So essentially, he doesn't want Donald Trump's defense using anything about the January 6th possibly being a false flag operation, the Fed surrection. So they don't want Donald Trump is not allowed to tell the jury or to use the possibility that the the riot on January 6th was conducted by our own government institutions like they don't want Donald Trump to be able to use that as a defense. Is this not insane? That's a big part of Donald Trump's defense, being how the riot never would have taken place if the FBI and the provocateurs didn't provoke the riot, period. And so the very issue they're claiming Donald Trump is this incited an insurrection. Well, what happens when it was actually the FBI or our own government institutions that incited the insurrection? Well, then you have a big problem, which that would mean Donald Trump is an innocent man, would it not? I think it's outrageous that they're not allowing Donald Trump to use this as a defense. (laughs) I I really do. This is the lawlessness I'm talking about. Not allowing Donald Trump to say, yes, I think the FBI was behind the riots on January 6th that day. I think the FBI provoked the riots on January 6th, which means I'm innocent because I couldn't possibly have incited the riots that day if it was the FBI that actually incited the riots because they had undercover informants telling people to go, 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 helping people upstairs, so on and so forth. And so this is the problem. Not allowing Donald Trump to use that as a defense, I find outrageous. And it, and it should disgust everybody, right? Because you, if Donald Trump can prove that the FBI was indeed the cause of the riot, by having provocateurs in the crowd, undercover agents by the hundreds, maybe even, maybe even thousands, then that would mean that Donald Trump is an innocent man and it was actually the government that provoked the riots on January 6th. <laughs> and Jack Smith not allowing him to use that as a defense, I find is just disgusting. It's complete lawlessness here, folks. This is a Stalinist show trial. This is a trial that the Soviet Union used to conduct back in, during the Soviet Union. This is something the Nazi Germany used to do back in the 1930s, show trials. These are trials. This is a weaponized justice system, a weaponized court through partisan judges and prosecutors that are using the process and the system to kneecap Joe Biden's political rivals. That is what's happening. And they're also using the justice system to persecute any dissenters. Very, very terrifying stuff. And that's why I recommend reading 1984. It's the, you, you see the same stuff being used in George Orwell's 1984. And so Donald Trump had a comment about this. President Trump previously attacked Jack Smith for filing an illegal motion in yet another attempt to muzzle him and take away his First Amendment. So through public, so this is what Jack Smith said. He said, through public statements, filings, and argument and hearings before the court, the defense has attempted to inject into this case partisan political attacks and irrelevant and prejudicial issues that have no place in a jury trial. Jack Smith's 20-page filing said, bullshit. I think if the, if the Donald Trump's defense team can prove that the, the government was the main provocateurs, and, and incited the January 6th riot that day, 
then that would be the defense I used. And they should have every single right to use that as a defense. And Donald Trump has every right to show that to a jury. Why? Because I think it's pretty important for a jury to know that type of information. What happens when Donald Trump's defense gets up there and looks the jurors in the face and says, so here, right here is a video. Here are the list of federal agents that were undercover that day that were wearing MAGA gear, that were dressed up in MAGA gear, and they show them video clips of them saying, go, 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 chanting on the, chanting on the riots and, and helping people upstairs. What happens when they show that evidence to the, tr- to the jury? What do you think the jury is going to say? They're going to say, well, I mean, if the government was doing this and the FBI had all these undercover agents in the crowd that could have acted as provocateurs like a false flag operation, then Donald Trump can't possibly be responsible for inciting an insurrection, right? Boom. This is why they don't want Donald Trump using this as a defense. And I find it absolutely disgusting. We don't know what type of discovery Donald Trump has, Donald Trump's defense has. We just don't know. I have a feeling they got stuff that is going to blow people's minds. Donald Trump is happy as a clam right now. Donald Trump is cool, calm, and collective. Way more than than I would be. I would be like, if I was in his situation, I don't know how this guy has not like crumbled by now. Donald Trump is not acting like a guilty man. He's acting like an innocent man. What does an innocent man do all the time? Well, he acts like an innocent person and continues on with his life, continues on with his campaign. What, what does a guilty person do? Well, a guilty person would drop out of a race and cower down into a corner in the fetal position or just run away. Donald Trump is doing neither of those. And he's standing up for what he knows. He's standing up for what he believes in. And that is the truth that Donald Trump is an innocent man and that this entire January 6th insurrection bullshit was a false flag operation conducted by the United States federal agencies, the uh, uh, intel agencies against the American people. So Nancy Pelosi can create a January 6th select committee and spend millions of dollars of taxpayer money on a J6 report so that they can take that report and use it in all these blue states around the country to try and remove Donald Trump from the ballot. Don't you see? This is their plan. This has been their plan all along. These people are not dumb. The Democrat Party are some of the most cunning, smart, evil group of people that I have ever experienced in my life. And when you dig down into the facts behind these stories and these events taking place, It's always the same names involved in all of this stuff. Jack Smith, this is not the first time Jack Smith has been a part of a a political weaponized trial like this, a show trial. He's done this multiple times before. It's always the same people. They had this planned out for a long time. I don't know how they're going to show that the government and the intel agencies were involved in inciting the January 6th insurrection. I have a feeling Ray Epps may be a part of that somehow, some way. And that's another story we're going to talk about tomorrow because something, a, a case, there's a story behind that too that just came out a few minutes ago, but I got I to gotta read into it. Well, I have a feeling what it's about. But these people have planned this the entire time. And all this is one gigantic orchestrated political weapon. They had, I'm going to lay this out. This is what I believe. This, in my opinion, this is, this is exactly the plan that they're using because we can all see this culminating. What we're watching right now is the Democrats' plan to win the 2024 election and retain power and to prevent the American people from getting their country back. They used the intel agencies like Yogananda Pittman. They used intel agencies like undercover informants for the FBI, which we now are starting to learn that a lot of these informants were Antifa that got arrested during the riots during the 2020 Floyd Palooza riots uh, back in uh, the summer of 2020. Uh, These are the so-called undercover informants. They use these informants because they're they're not actual FBI employees. They can use them very differently. So they use these type of undercover agents as provocateurs. They dress them up in MAGA gear. They send them out into the crowd. They have body cams on them, and they use these provocateurs to provoke the riots. 
right? You have Yogananda Pittman that had intel. She had intel from various agencies that said there was a very high chance of violence taking place that day. She had this intel, Yogananda Pittman. She did not share it with anybody. You had Steve Sund that under oath and sworn, sworn deposition, sworn testimony said that if he received this intel from Yogananda Pittman, it would have been vital to securing the Capitol that day. He did not receive the information. You had Tyreek Johnson, who was a Capitol Hill police lieutenant that was overseeing the entire uh, certification of the vote that day of the election, the entire process. So he was like the top guy. So you have Steve Sund, who definitely should have had that intel, and you had Tariq Johnson, who also should have had that intel. Neither one of these men received that intel, right? Who had it? Yogananda Pittman. Yogananda Pittman was the lead intel officer for the Capitol Police. And where's Yogananda Pittman now? Gone. Yogananda Pittman, shortly after the, the riots, after Joe Biden won the election, Yogananda Pittman was put on administrative leave with pay. She then got another job at a college in California with pay. Mind you, she's still being paid by the taxpayers here. So she got a security job, I think, at Berkeley College. All this on administrative leave. In the testimony of Steve Sund, um, I forget who asked him, but there was a congressperson that asked him, have you ever heard of this happening, essentially giving somebody administrative leave with pay and allowing them to move to another state to, hold, to get a different job? He said no. In fact, it's actually not even allowed in the employee handbook. And so that, I find, pretty, pretty fishy there, right? So Yogananda Pittman seems like somebody that should be questioned. And that's something we're going to get into in a minute. And I, I know this went on for a long time, but I want to go, I want to wrap all this up in a big bow for you. And this is my opinion on how they used the January 6th riot as a political weapon. So because Yogananda Pittman and these guys didn't have this intel, there was not the security that was needed to protect the Capitol that day. And so when you have strategically placed provocateurs, undercover informants that are hired by the FBI to provoke violence that day and essentially incite the riot by telling people to go, helping people upstairs, and then you get the whole mob involved. And what happened was the Capitol Police started firing on friendlies with stinger grenades, rubber bullets. When you look at the video footage now, and this is exactly why the J6 committee did not want to release all the footage. They only released what they wanted you to see. They cherry-picked footage. This is also why they hired a CBS uh, producer to produce the video footage by adding audio and, and strategically editing the video to add drama to it, essentially. Why else would you hire a CBS or, or NBC producer? They wanted to add as much emotion uh, and drama to this video as possible. And they cherry-picked what footage people wanted to see to manipulate the public because at the same exact time, the media was sitting there calling it a deadly insurrection, insurrection, insurrection. All these Capitol Police officers were beaten to death and all this happened. Come to find out, it was all a lie. No officers died there that day. The only person to die was Ashley Babbitt, a protester on January 6th. And so the entire thing was one gigantic narrative. And they did a narrative saturation, and they just kept saying it over and over and over again, an insurrection, insurrection, insurrection. And so at the same time, they're poisoning the, they're manipulating the public. They are starting this J6 select committee, and they're bringing in witnesses, giving testimony, cherry-picked witnesses, cherry-picked testimony. It's completely one-sided, partisan, because they, Nancy Pelosi rejected the original members from the Republican, that the Republican Party nominated. She rejected the original Republican nominees and hand-selected her own Republicans to create essentially her own committee so that it can be a bipartisan committee, in quotations, when really she picked the two Republicans that hated Donald Trump the most, Liz Cheney and Adam Kissinger. So think about that. She rejected the original committee members that were nominated by the Republican Party. She rejected them, and she hand-picked her own. And the ones that she picked just so happened to hate Donald Trump. Why? Because if you hate Donald Trump, then you're not going to cross-examine the witnesses very well, are you? 
You're not going to want to cross-examine any witnesses with any questions you might have that may prove Donald Trump's innocence or that may prove that this was incited by the federal government or intel agencies. And so that's exactly what happened. Nancy Pelosi had a select committee where there was no cross-examination, no questions were allowed to be asked to the witnesses, no substantial questions anyways. All of it was a show trial. All of it was designed to come up with one single product, and that product was the January 6th report. This was a report that was put together, a very, very big report, that essentially lambasts Donald Trump and accuses him of everything that happened that day, and he's a violent insurrectionist, and that he is solely responsible for inciting an insurrection on the United States Capitol that day. That's essentially what the report says. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but it's something like that. It certainly doesn't make Donald Trump look good. Um, it makes Donald Trump look as worse as it can be, and it makes Nancy Pelosi look innocent, when really, in reality, it's actually a massive security failure, is what January 6th was. It was a massive security failure because Mayor Bowser, the mayor of D.C. rejected the 25,000 National Guard troops or the 20,000, however, rejected the National Guard troops that Donald Trump approved. So Donald Trump requested troops, approved the troops, did whatever he had to do. And Mayor Bowser said, no, we don't want the troops. Nancy Pelosi is responsible for the security on January 6th, right? So the J6 report was made to come out, was all created as a tool to make it look like it was all Donald Trump's fault. To create this report that they're now using where? All over in these blue states. And so judges are, uh, these judges and this crew, C-R-E-W, these, these group of attorneys that are going state to state filing lawsuits to keep Trump off the ballot, they're basing their entire case off of that report, the J-6 report, the taxpayer-funded report. They're basing all of it off of that report to remove Donald Trump from the ballot. There you go. So all of this was planned. They're using that report to remove Donald Trump off the ballot because that is their plan. We're watching the Democrat Party's plan unfold right before our eyes. The purpose of Jack Smith and all the 91 indictments is not for justice. It's in order to sway the mind of the public and to kneecap Donald Trump and his campaign, to keep him wrapped up in the court, spending millions and millions of dollars a week, so that it, it essentially keeps him from campaigning vigorously. But because of Jack Smith and all these indictments, it's essentially kneecapping Donald Trump, and it's keeping him wrapped up in all these cases, right? It's distracting him. It's making him, you know, he's got a court date that was scheduled to be right before Super Tuesday. They have these court cases so politically aligned that judges, the judge Eileen Cannon in Florida, had to contact another judge in D.C. and said, did you realize that you have these cases scheduled to where Donald Trump is supposed to be at two places at the same time? <laughs> this is how politically motivated this is. So the Jack Smith stuff, the indictments, is to kneecap Donald Trump's campaign. The January 6th report and the J6, um, the J6 Fed surrection, the false flag operation, was to remove Donald Trump from the ballot. It's a one-two punch, right? My only question is, what is their uppercut? There must be a final finishing move here. I don't know what it is, but you know as well as I do, there's going to be something. And I can't imagine what it could be, whether it's another pandemic, whether it's, you know, some EMP blast. There's a lot of talk out there, a lot of theories, but rest assured, it's going to be something. And that is going to be the Democrats' final move. You're talking about the smartest, most corrupt, powerful people on the face of the planet. You're talking about portions of intel agencies that were specifically designed to topple foreign governments. Norm Eisen is part of, he was part of a, a, a um, division of an intel agency that was specifically designed to topple foreign governments. Whether that means creating insurrections, coups, false flag operations, whatever it is. Those same people that we gave power to, that we essentially turned into a foreign government toppling weapon, are being used now 
in our own government against our own elections. These are the types of names I'm talking about when I tell you it's the same group of people in this entire circle. And all these different stories, when you dig down to the nitty gritty, it's the same names. It's the same people that were part of the Ukraine impeachment, the Russia collusion hoax, the same damn people. It's all one gigantic plan to keep and retain power in the 2024 election. And listen, I got a pretty strong gut feeling about this. I just don't know what their final move is. I don't know what it is. I can't begin to tell you what it is. All I could do is tell you what they're capable of. And they are capable of anything. And when you have, like I said, and when you have divisions of intel agencies that are designed specifically to topple foreign governments working against Donald Trump, working for the Democrat Party, working to keep and retain power for the Democratic Party and the establishment, you know it's going to be something sinister. It's going to probably be something diabolical. I have no idea because these are very evil, diabolical people. You're talking about people that if Donald Trump's elected, And he goes after these people. You're talking about people that committed crimes. You're talking about people that have committed some of the biggest atrocities you can think of. I'm talking stuff that you see in movies. Donald Trump being elected and him coming out and saying he's going after the intel agencies. He's going after the swamp. He's going after the establishment. He's going after the corruption. These people are pissing their pants. And you're talking about just like, um, just like what's his name said. What's uh, 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 Chuck Schumer? When you mess with the intel agencies, they have seven ways from Sunday at getting back at you. These are the most powerful evil people in the world, and they're all working to prevent Donald Trump from winning the election and giving the American people their country back. So expect anything from these people. I don't know what it is, but I will continue to work on it. Um, as far as the Jack Smith cases go, I don't think any of these cases are going to see the light of day before the election. But again. That's not the point. The point is to kneecap Donald Trump and his campaign, right? So now you know that part. The second part is the J6 report to try and use that report to remove him off the ballot. You see how all of this is coming together now, folks? We've been talking about this for months. So if you've been listening to the show, this is something we've been on to for months and months and months. And as we get closer to the election, just like I said, the more desperate these people are going to get. They're going to get more desperate because people are going to start seeing their plan unfolding. When the American people start to see this plan unfold, they're going to, it's going to be rejected wholeheartedly. And they know that. And that's why it's important for them to try and get Donald Trump removed off the ballot. These people tell you they're, they're defenders of democracy. In fact, the Secretary of State, this, I think her name is Howell in Maine, that removed Donald Trump from the ballot in Maine, she was wearing a t-shirt that said democracy defenders at a marathon that she was running. These people are clearly delusional. They have been psychologically and emotionally broken by Donald Trump. These people do not care about democracy. Everything they tell you is a lie. And everything these people touch, they destroy. The Democrat Party and the powers that be, the globalist elites, are the most destructive political force we have ever seen in U.S. history. These people are the threats to our democracy and our democratic process. These people are the threats to our constitutional republic. Everything that they accuse their opponents of doing, they themselves have done, are currently doing, or plan on doing in the future. They do nothing but project onto their opponents. That's it. And so when you, wear it, when you, when you see these people talk about how they're big, great defenders of democracy— as they're trying to remove Joe Biden's political rival off the ballot so the American people can't vote for him, then you know that these people are full of shit. It's as simple as that. And as Donald Trump's numbers start to go up and Joe Biden start to go down, just like they are historically low numbers, you're going to see these people do something we've never seen before. I don't know what it is. That is what we have to figure out, ladies and gentlemen. What is their plan? What are they trying to do? I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I can't even begin to imagine what these people are capable of. Another pandemic? Uh, I don't know. I would hope not for the simple fact that in order to get people to that level of fear again that there was in the 2020 election, it would have to be a significantly more dangerous virus. People would have to see some serious death and destruction in order for them to fall for that again. 
And I would hate to think that they would create something like that to win an election. But again, you're talking about very evil people. Will it be some type of war? Civil war? I don't know. Will it be an I I seem to think it's going to be a false flag operation. I think the Democrats, the the evil powers that be, the, the corrupt Washington establishment are going to try and create some type of false flag operation to make the Republicans look bad um, because they have to change public opinion. If, that, if Joe Biden wants to stay on the ballot and he's going to be their candidate, these people are going to be really desperate. And don't be surprised if they pick someone else to be their candidate because Joe Biden, if this is what they're going with, he's going to lose. I mean, I think Democrats are going to lose regardless and they know it. And that is why you see these executive orders from the Biden administration taking effect, essentially burrowing in bureaucrats in the in the uh, in the machine. So essentially, they're they're making rules and regulations to where it's going to be harder for the next sitting president to remove these bureaucrats from their positions. Why would you do that if you thought that you were going to win the next election? Exactly. I think they know Donald Trump's going to win. However, I think there's much more sinister stuff planned by these people. And I think they were going to use they're going to try and manipulate the public somehow, maybe by using the intel agencies again, conducting another false flag operation to target Republicans as domestic terrorists. They're already characterizing and categorizing us as domestic terrorists. Um, You see this up and down the paperwork. You see this in the institutions. We talk about it all the time. I just don't know how they're going to go about doing it, but I know they're going to do something. And we got to make sure that we pay attention. For the next 11 months, you have to stay frosty, folks. You have to keep your head on a swivel. We got to make sure we stay vigilant to everything around us, to our surroundings, to everything. Because I don't know what these people, I know what these people are capable of. I just don't know what they're going to do. Would they, you know, let off some type of EMP blast to completely collapse our electrical grid so that there can't be any elections, legit elections like with voting machines? And so it's essentially going to create chaos. But again, so, uh, but remember, these people are the masters of chaos. They are the chaos and the cloud and Piven tactic. You try and destabilize a institution so that you can corrupt it and overtake it. Um, so I, there's going to be some type of destabilization tactic. I just don't know what. I I can't even begin to tell you what it is. Um, and also, the we have the Super Bowl of elections this year. This is a very unique year, folks. Very unique. Because here is an article from The Guardian. So 2024 will be the Super Bowl of global elections. Yeah. This is, it's very, very... Um, very wild stuff that's happening this year. So there is going to be a, this is an article from The Guardian. It says, Democracy's Super Bowl, 40 elections that will shape global politics in 2024. A record-breaking 40-plus countries representing more than 40% of the world's population and an outsized chunk of global GDP are due to hold national elections in 2024. The outcomes taken separately and together will help determine who controls and directs the 21st century world. Mm Mm-hmm. So remember, remember I was talking about the intel agencies, the the divisions that are designed to topple governments? These people are going to be all over the place trying to manipulate different different, uh, elections. And you know, the crazy thing is, is the Democrats think that Joe Biden or Democrats as a whole are going to have the ability to go out there on the stump and talk about how America is some leader in democracy and how America is the shining beacon for democracy. These people, they can never talk about democracy again. These people are the destroyers of democracy. They are the ones single-handedly kneecapping democracy right now in America. So all these countries will never take these people serious again. This is the type of damage, the unintended consequences from Democrats' ideas that they never realize. They never have to be held accountable for these. And so from here on out, Democrats fail to realize that they can no longer lecture any other country about their democracy, their elections again. Because these people are destroying our elections here. They are trying to imprison Joe Biden's chief political rival and the Democrats' chief political rival, without a doubt. They are imprisoning political dissenters because we now have 
real political prisoners inside our nation's capital in D.C. like we are freaking modern day Stalingrad with the J6 protesters. And so how do Democrats honestly think they're going to be go to go out and lecture any of these different countries about how they hold their elections and their democracy? They're nuts. These people don't even realize it. But these other countries are going to look at them and they're going to say, well, you guys are doing the same thing. <laughs> I mean, the Democrats have literally turned this country into something more similar to uh, uh, Bolivia or Venezuela than America. You know, they were pulling this country down to third world status all because their hatred for Donald Trump. Listen, I don't think the people realize what we're talking about now. Like, I don't think Dem the Democrat voters as a whole, some may be, I don't think they are as, as privy to the information we are. And so th they're just going to go with the flow. Like, they're just going with it, you know, whatever. Yeah, you, you know, well, we are the champions of democracy. But these people that know what they're doing, like they know they're using the justice system as a political weapon to to kneecap Donald Trump and to prevent him from being president. Like these people that know Joe Biden is using the Department of Justice as a personal lawyer to protect his family and to to persecute political dissenters. Like these people know what they're doing. <laughs> so like, you know, they, they not all of them are dumb. You know, they, they know what they're doing and they don't even care. That's the crazy thing. Like they're perfectly OK with using the system to kneecap Donald Trump. That, to me, is the wildest part. So these people are perfectly okay with bringing this country down to banana republic status just so long as it means Donald Trump doesn't win the election. <laughs> They're nuts. They are nuts. They are uh, clinically insane, man. Clinically insane. They have been psychologically and emotionally broken. And so, listen, that's all I got for now. This went on for way too long. Um, but I'm glad we got to talk about this. And now you know what Jack Smith is up to. Now you know what the plan is with the Democrats and the J6 committee report and the, the report that they're using to remove Trump off the ballots. These are the things I think are important. I think they're way more important than Epstein's uh, sex ring in the Epstein Island. That's such BS with Aaron Rodgers, the whole Aaron Rodgers, Jimmy Kimmel thing. Now Jimmy Kimmel is suing Aaron Rodgers for defamation because... <laughs> Aaron Rodgers went on live on Twitter, did an interview with, uh, what's his name, Pat McAfee's show, and said that Jimmy Kimmel's going to be on that list when it gets released, all this stuff. So, like, that to me is great. It's awesome entertainment. I think people need to know about it, but it's not really what I think you need to know. I think people more now than ever need to be prepared for what is getting ready to happen in the next 11 months, because it is going to be insane. We're going to see things we have never seen take place in this country before. It's going to be wild. I'm talking, I don't know. I don't know what the Democrats are going to do, but they're going to do something. They are going to, to, there is a third piece to this puzzle, folks, that I don't know what it is. And I'm not going to stop until I find out, but I don't want to find out too late. So as soon as I get this figured out, and trust me, I think about it all day, every day when I'm going through this stuff. As soon as I figure it out, we are going to walk through it together. But as of right now, I think it's vitally important for you to know Jack Smith's plan the reason behind the indictments and the reason behind the January 6th, the, the January 6th committee and why all these things are all playing or why all these things are a piece to one gigantic puzzle. It's all one gigantic plan that was created by some of the smartest, most cunning and most evil people the world has to offer in conjunction with various government intel agencies like the leader, like the top echelon of the FBI and the CIA. And these divisions that are designed to topple governments, how they're all working together to subvert democracy and the will of the American people to keep and retain power and to prevent the American people from getting their country back and figuring out all the crimes that these people have committed over the last 60, 70 years. <laughs> That's what this is all about. People are really starting to realize just how corrupt their government is, man. And I do have to say, for as much as I'm always lecturing my listeners about staying vigilant and getting active this election and doing the most you can, uh, getting people out to vote, go out there, contribute, make a difference. You have to get involved. Getting involved is what I preach to my listeners all the time. Well, I took my own advice and I have officially applied for the Project 2025. I, I filled out my application. I sent it in today to be a political appointee 
for the transition project in 2025, the Trump administration transition project uh, the, called Project 2025. So I have filled out my application and sent my resume, submitted it, all my information. Um, I told them about the show, all that stuff. And so I've essentially committed myself um, for whatever they need me for. And I told them that I don't have experience as a political appointee, but I see not having experience in politics and government as a strength, not a weakness. Um, because I think that's one of the biggest problems with with our establishment right now is that just like Thomas Sowell said uh, back, he was doing an interview one day and he said the Americans that should be in politics aren't. And the people that shouldn't be in politics are. And that is the problem. He's exactly right. The, you know, Thomas Sowell, obviously one of the great philosophers of our time. He's right. So I decided that I'm going to contribute as much as I can to this cause. And whether that means whatever I have to be trained in, whatever I have to learn, I will do it. Um, I will dedicate my time fully. I will dedicate my knowledge, my wisdom to the matters. I want to be ready to rock and roll so that as soon as Donald Trump wins, we can hit the beach running. The problem that Donald Trump had in his previous administration was he didn't have enough time to formulate the bureaucracy, his own bureaucracy. That is the problem. Donald Trump got in there and it was just death by a thousand cuts because he just didn't know that there was that many. He didn't know how deep the swamp was. And so now when Donald Trump wins this time, he's going to have to drain the swamp not just drain it, but replace the swamp with regular Americans. And that's exactly what Project 2025 is. I think it's being, um, it's being run by the Heritage Foundation and multiple different entities and nonprofits. So I signed up for that today. So there you go. I am willing to contribute my time. I'm willing to do whatever needs to be done so that I can give my kids a country that I had growing up. Because as of right now, I'm watching our country be destroyed by the evils at work. And so whatever I can do to help, I will do it. And so I applied for the position today. So we'll see what happens. I will definitely keep you informed on my journey. We'll see what happens. If I have to go to DC, I will. If they don't need me in DC, I won't. Whatever it is I need to do. Because listen, folks, if you don't do something now, then you're going to watch this beautiful country of ours disappear. And then you're going to be talking about these days, 30, 40 years from now, about what you should have done. And you're going to be talking to your kids around the fire. And you're going to, they're going to be asking you questions about, hey, Grandpa, where were you when America was free? When America had First Amendment and could say whatever they wanted? And America could protest to petition their government? Where were you when all that was taken? You can say, I did everything I could to prevent it from happening. And that's it. That's all we need. We just need people to get involved. I know it's hard. Conservatives, Republicans don't like doing it. Trust me, I know. We are like the last people that want to get involved in this shit. Like, we just want to be left alone. That is it. I totally get it. But this is exactly why the powers that, the powers that be have control that they do. is because conservatives and Republicans and patriots just kind of sat back and expected the system to have our best interest. And we kicked our feet up and we said, OK, but what happened was, is it got out of control. We gave these people too much power and we, we neglected to pay attention and have proper oversight. And so it turned into like this, this freaking Frankenstein fourth branch government that's now just absolutely wreaking havoc on our institutions and our country as a whole. It is taking a sledgehammer to the pillars of our constitutional republic. And so. We must get involved. Now is your call to duty. This is exactly what you're here for. We are here for these exact moments right now. And these moments are yours for all of time. These are the moments the framers of this country would be so proud of. The American citizens stepping up and petitioning their government and replacing it with the government that better fits their needs. And that's exactly what I think Project 2025 is. And I'm willing to dedicate my life, my, my resources, whatever it is that I need to dedicate, I will do. I, we must do something, folks. We have to do something in this, in this situation. It's the call of duty, my friends. That is what it is. You have been called to duty. So listen, if you want to, if you want to do what I did and apply for the position at Project 2025, 
Just go to project2025.org. There's a questionnaire, a very detailed questionnaire that you have to fill out because they got to make sure that they're they're not, you know, bringing in some some progressive lunatic that wants to replace everything with windmills. And so they have to make sure that you line that your philosophy aligns with the goals of what we're trying to bring here. And so they don't want some radical Democrat progressive coming in as an undercover like saboteur uh, to 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 sabotage the entire transition project. So they need people that really align philosophically to 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 conservatism, traditional conservatism, neoconservatism, whatever it is. Um, and so there's a questionnaire you got to go through. Do it. See what you got. Just submit it. If they want you, they'll bring you on. If they don't, then what harm is done? I, honestly, I, it really made me think really hard. It asked me um, what policy members and public figures that I admire, all these things. And it, the questionnaire is great. It's excellent. It really makes you think about why you are politically the way you are and why you carry the philosophy you do. I told them I used to be a Democrat, voted for Obama in 08. I became politically homeless after I realized Obama sucked and it was a mistake. I didn't vote in 2012. And then Donald Trump came along. Donald Trump came along and it changed everything for me. I, I don't know the exact time when I changed my philosophy, but I would imagine it was when I grew older, I grew wiser, and which is pretty common for conservatives. There's always that joke we say all the time on the show is, what do you call a Democrat that grows wise? A conservative. And so it's not, it's, it's because there is some semblance of truth to it. This is why the Democrat Party has all the younger voters, is because younger people are easier to manipulate. They're easier to take advantage of, whether that's through media, whether it's through culture, uh, education. And so this is why the Democrats want younger and younger voters, too. They want like 15-year-olds to vote because they know they have the younger base. But that's, that's not always the case. That's starting to change. Younger voters, because of shows like this and alternative media as a whole, is starting to change the game. And Democrats realize this. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why they want open borders. They're trying to change the voting demographic in this country. They see these illegal asylum seekers not as people that just need help and they're poor and hungry. No, they see these people as future votes. That's exactly what's happening. And so maybe that's what we'll talk about on the next show. But that's certainly what's happening now. But this show certainly went on for far too long. So yes, if you guys want to get a hold of me, you have any questions about Project 2025, just email me, stephentoriellashow at gmail.com. If you have any questions at all, send me an email. You, you can follow the show on any social media platform. We're out there all over. If you could, I really appreciate it. Follow the podcast on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. Uh, leave a five-star review. Leave a message. I really like to know how you feel about the show, what you like, what you don't like, leave a five-star review, leave a comment. I like some constructive criticism. And also, if you could follow the show on Rumble, I post all the episodes there every day and I also to YouTube, but I really want to promote Rumble, but I will use YouTube if that's what it takes. So I, I post to both, but I would rather tell you, I would rather promote Rumble rather than YouTube. We have to try and create our parallel economy here. And so Rumble is the platform for freedom. Rumble supports freedom of speech. They don't censor. They don't do any of that BS. They don't have any crazy algorithms. It's all open source. So that is so that is what I'm going to support. And that's what I'm going to promote. So if you could follow the show on Rumble, I always appreciate it. If you could share the show with your friends and family, keep them informed. Let them know what, about what we talked about today and what the Democrat and the globalist elites plans are for the 2024 election. Keep them informed. That is the name of the game, folks. From day one, this show was always about informing the people because informed people make informed decisions. And right now we're suffering from bad decision after bad decision being made by uninformed people. So share the show with your friends and family. Follow me on Rumble. Follow the show on all social media platforms. And as always, I want you guys to have a good day. Have a great week. God bless you, and God bless America. You guys have a good day. Bye-bye.